You know, it's always a good question. If this church didn't exist, how much difference would it make? I think that's a fair question. And I, as a pastor, have always, always uh, internally loved the answer to that question because this church has always had such an impact in this community and an influence. You've been, you have been a force, and I want you to know that. And so if we didn't exist, I guarantee you things would be very different around here. Um, in this community, in this city, lives in people's homes, in this, in this county, in many churches that we have the chance to, to partner with and, and to really uh, be friends with. So anyways, you make a difference, I want you to know that. Um, the kingdom is moving. So open your Bibles to Philippians chapter three. We continue our series, part five, we're talking about reaching for it all. Again, in this year of reach, this first few months, we're talking about us as the body of Christ saying, God, I want everything you have for me. I want all of it. I want all of it. And I don't know how that hits you this morning. You're jumping in our series, welcome. Um, just know there's, there is an intention to stoke a flame, to stir you up, to startle you awake, whatever it takes, there is an intention this morning. There's a whole intention to this next three months that this happens in our lives more and more and more that we might find ourselves like Paul with such a fixed passion for everything God had in store for us when he saved us. Are you with me? Are you with me? If you're new, that is my way of saying amen. Are you, you know, are we tracking? Are we all on the same page? Um, and so it's an Orange County thing maybe because if, you know, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'll stop right there. As this is an Olympic year, the, this message today is so appropriate for, um, for the season that we're in, in 2024. Paul, more than anybody, had a picture and an image in his mind as he wrote to his churches and as he lived his own life out. At the Olympics, every Olympic athlete, now I can't speak for all of them, but I can find, it, find you a, a bunch of statements from Olympic athletes that talk about their preparation for the Olympics. They had a vision in mind. They had a picture in mind. They had the podium they had the podium ceremony in mind. They had, as they prepared, as they trained, as they, as they worked and worked and worked and, and were intentional about all the aspects of their life, as they said yes to things and no to things, they had this picture, and the picture was, I'm going to stand on that podium. The anthem of my nation is going to get played. They're gonna put a medal over my neck and I'll be there and the crowds will cheer. I will have that moment in the sun that day. Every Olympic athlete prepares with this day in mind. And this is the picture, if I could paint one, a similar picture that Paul has in mind. And in Paul's writings, Paul writes about this day more than anybody else. Jesus maybe talked about the day uh, in more words, in some of his parables and analogies and talking about when he returns and the kind of people he'll find when we get there and what that day will feel like for some and for others. But Paul speaks of this day from this actual picture of the podium. And he talks about the, the Bema seat. Have you ever heard of the Bema seat before? The Bema, the Bema. If you've ever been to, I actually pronounce it Bema, but a lot of you say Bema, so I'm just joining you. But if you've ever been to Corinth, and I've been there many times, and I, I love to take people, if I go to Corinth, there's one highlight for me. There's, not, there's a lot of low lights, but there's one really, really highlight for me in Corinth, and it is that they have excavated all the way down to the original road and where the road traveled, it was about like two, like, a, like, a, like an X that went right through the city, one going north and south, one going east and west, the major, major road. And along the major road, there is a place, you'll see a platform that is built, steps like this that go up, a little higher than this. And on the wall, you'll see the word 
Bema. And in every Greek town, every area, there was a particular Bema seat. And the Bema seat would be, yes, a place where judgment would be pronounced, for sure. In fact, Paul would actually stand before Gallio at the Bema seat there in Corinth. And Gallio would say, I have nothing to, I'm not interested in this case. Let it be dismissed. But in Paul's analogy, as he talks about the race, and he talks about running, in his picture, he had the other thing that happens at the Bama seat in mind. And at the end of the race, the racers, the, 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 the competitors, the one who would win, would come up to the same spot, that Bama seat, where the judge or the official, the, the, the person of honor would then give him the crown and give him the awards and then all of the acclaim would come and all of that would be the moment. And so he talks about this picture in front of him. And as we read in Philippians chapter three, as it continues on and he's talking about forgetting what's behind and straining toward what's ahead. He's saying, listen, my whole life is moving toward a day. And last week when we were talking about this, we, we were referring to the picture in front of him. What is he pursuing? And this is the picture. Let me read just the context of the scripture. The point is verse 14 that we'll look at today. It says, not that I've already obtained all this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. And brothers, I don't consider I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting is what is behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And let those of you who are mature think this way, and if in any way, anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In some of your translations, it might say, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly calling. Some say heavenly calling. There's not actually the word heavenly in the Greek. It is just upward, being called up. Called up to where? Called up to heaven. This is not the typical language for the rapture of the church. It's different. And certainly in light of his entire analogy of this race, it's most appropriate he is referring here to the Bema seat, the moment that the victor or the racer is called up to receive his award or her award that day in that place. What is unique to this picture, and this is so important for you to know what kind of moment we're talking about, is that for Paul, this picture was a a place for believers. When he talks about it, and I'm gonna read the passages that get into it and the context around them so you can see the hope that he had, In these passages, it is a place for believers. It's not where those who don't know Jesus are going to be judged, like in in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. That is a different place and a different time. This is the place or a time or the moment where we will, I will stand before my king, my righteous judge, to give an account for my life, not my failures, not my sin, but for my life and for what this race amounted to. And that's the picture that Paul paints, and you'll see it really clearly as we go through these passages, but I do want you to know this. If you're new here, this day and this picture is the greatest motivation behind your pastor in doing what I do, is preparing you for this day. Preparing you for this day, and you preparing your children for this day, and us as the people of God being prepared for this day. I'll never forget the the message my, my pastor gave years and years ago when I was just a youth and I remembered it. It's the most memorable message he ever gave. And it was about a dream that he had. And in the dream, he saw his congregation going and standing before Jesus. 
preparing for this moment. And one person in the congregation turned to him and said, Pastor, how come you never told us about this? How come you never told us this day was coming? And he woke up with this burning in him. And he shared about the, 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 the Bama seat with us. And I never forgot that. I forgot everything else he ever said, but I never forgot that. <laughs> that picture lodged, it burned. And the Lord used that. I mean, before I was ever called to ministry, the Lord used that picture in the back of my heart as this day is coming. But it's so important that you understand it from the lens that Paul is giving it. It is not a day to dread. Are you with me? This day is not a day to dread. It would be like every Olympic athlete dreading the podium. Not a single athlete prepares for the Olympics going, I hope I don't get called up there. I don't know what's gonna happen if I get called up there. They know exactly what would happen if they get called up there. Are you with me? That is a day for rewards. It's a day to look forward to. It's a day to anticipate. It's a day to know, oh man, I'll finally see the sum total of what my life was about from heaven's view. It was an exciting day to look forward to. And that day is the picture here. That's what Paul's in front of us. And so I'm gonna take three places where Paul speaks so clearly about this day. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. And I'm gonna kind of bring up why Paul was mentioning it and how it, what it meant to him then even as he's talking about it and what it says to us about this race that we're running. The first is simply this. I wanna talk to you about being aware that this race is about building. Now, seems like two separate analogies, but I gotta use this one. The picture is the podium in front of Paul being rewarded. Has really nothing to do about running at the moment. It's this picture standing to give an account. But what are we given an account for? And in 1 Corinthians chapter three, he tells us what the race is really about. He talks about the church, and I wanna read this to you and explain that really he's talking about the body of Christ and the part we play in seeing it grow and become and built and effective in our day. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, the only foundation that is any foundation at all. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day. The day is he referring to the day. The day of rewards, the day we stand at the Bama, the day we stand before Jesus to give an account for our life. That day, we'll disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward and if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. So he himself will be saved, but as through the fire. So in this first beginning picture, I want you to catch a picture of the day. Paul is referring to the divisions that are going on in the church. He's addressing a church that is kind of at itself. It's like bickering over, I follow Apollos, and I follow Paul, and I follow Peter. Well, I follow Jesus, so I just trumped you all. And it's like there's just all these divisions in the church, and he's saying, listen, guys, I came there first, and I laid a foundation for you. I told you about Jesus. I shared the gospel with you. I started something. That's the only foundation that matters. And when in race language, he's the author, and he's the finisher of the race. No other foundation matters just so we see it. It starts the day we come to faith in Jesus. 
and it ends the day we stand before Jesus. That is the sum total of our race. He's at the starting line, and he's at the finish line. Are you with me? He's the author and the finisher. That's the foundation I laid. Apollos came, and others have come, and they've taught you more, and you're starting to, to, to put some pieces together, and you are also blessing the body, but here's what you gotta understand. The foundation of the church, Jesus, that's the beginning point, but in your building, in your way, how are you affecting the church? How are you building? How are you about the business of Jesus in this world? And to the degree to which you're about the business of Jesus, that work, when you stand before him one day, that work will get tested. Did you do it for you or did you do it for him? And the things we talked about last week, the the why we're in the race, the how we're running, the heart motivations, this is what he's saying. All that stuff gets exposed. All that stuff gets exposed on that day. But here's the thing. All those things you did because of your love for Jesus, out of this foundation of who he is, he called you in. Obedience to him, faithfulness to him, all that stuff is like gold and precious metals, and precious stones, it doesn't burn. But all the stuff that you do for you, all the rivalries and dissensions and divisions and all the dumb things you quarrel about in church and stuff like that and the way you treat one another that isn't kind or like Jesus, all that stuff, listen, whatever work comes out of all that, it gets burned up. It's pointless. You did it for you, you did it out of this, you did it whatever, that stuff is pointless, there's no reward. But everything else, everything else, everything else, talk about rewards in a minute, but everything else. But that's the picture, and he goes on in chapter, as he's telling this, well I wanna stop for a moment, I just want you to catch a picture, what am I talking about? Those this morning who got up and came to church early just to make coffee so all these people would be awake. (laughs) That's a part of building the church. Those of you who carried the gospel, shared something with a coworker, that's a part of building the church. Those of you who gave of your tithes and offerings this morning, this week, that's a part of building the church. Those of you who are going on that mission trip, those of you who are gonna be praying for those in your family who don't know Jesus, that's a part of building the church. Those of you who greeted with the little tag in the morning and just welcomed people so they felt like people care that I'm here today, that's a part of building the church. Those who practiced all the work and all the stuff they put in this week so they could lead us in worship, it's a part of building the church. This Wednesday when we're teaching on on how to hear God, it's a part of building the church. It's equipping, it's reaching the lost. All those things are a part of building the church. And he says, listen, those of you who are part of my business, Luke 19, Jesus giving this picture of the analogy, I'm leaving for a while, I'm gonna go receive a kingdom and I'm coming back. But this is my command to my servants, do business until I come. Be about the things I'm about. Until I get back, be about my business. Why does he say things like that? Because isn't it easy to be about our own business? But listen, our own business is the stuff, that's the wood and the hay and the stubble. You can be about your own business all you want. Just listen, on that day, that's the flammable stuff. Or you can be about his business. And on the day, that's the stuff that's there when it's all done being burned up. Wow. And he just says, listen, if you know the day is coming, build accordingly. Build with that heart in mind. And he goes on to say this. This is now, this is just verse, this is just chapter four. He's continuing this thought. This is how one should regard us. He's talking about his role as servants of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not here thereby acquitted. 
It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, the day, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Commendation, epinos, praise, acclaim is what it means. Just so you know, he wants to applaud you. He wants to applaud you. Like that day is coming. And he says, part of that, it's, it's the whole idea that Jesus speaks about in the parables. We're stewards of a time on this side of heaven, in this part of our race. We are stewards of somebody else's stuff and time. Are you with me? Are you sure? Do you think and do you see your life like on this side of heaven before you stand at the finish line, everything that goes toward the finish line on this side, I'm just a steward of it. Everything I think is my own is really because of him and now it's for him. And those are the things I get to steward and be accountable to the Lord for. It's the resources he gives me. It's the people he puts in my life. Listen, I feel a strong accountability to all of you all the time. In the back of my mind is the thought, man, these people you've entrusted me to love and care for, the people in my home, I don't want any of them to get away. Get away from knowing you and knowing the truth and knowing what you're about and God, the way I'm with them, I want to steward that way. As if one day I'll be accountable to you for how I love my wife, how I love my sons, how I treated my parents. As if one day I'll be accountable to you to how I treat my friends, my church family, the body here, this calling to a city. That day, Paul says, listen, I think I do a lot of things out of the right motives, but honestly, I don't even know. I hope, I I hope that it's because of Jesus. I hope that, but probably mixed in there is some me too. But here's what happens. That day, he knows. He sees it. I'll let him decide like what is worthy and what isn't in that day. And secondly, maybe most important, I don't know, maybe it's most important, it's the one I get most excited about. Be aware that it's worth it. The day, the bema, the time we stand before Jesus, just be aware that it's worth it. It's worth it. How much is it worth it? All of it. All of it. It's worth all of it. And he says it here in in 2 Corinthians as he's writing to the church again. He says these words. I'm gonna give you two chunks from chapter four and a little little chunk from chapter five. He says, so we do not lose heart because I want you to catch the picture of what he's talking about. Though our outer self is wasting away, this body is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction, he just went through a whole lot of stuff that he listed out as affliction, just so you know. Now he's calling it all light. This light, momentary affliction, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the Bema of Christ, so that each may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. So important that you understand the word evil there is not evil in sin. This day is not about sin. That word evil is translated worthless. Worthless. 
Good, valuable. Evil, worthless. That's the picture he's painting. That we might give an account that day for what we did that was valuable or worthless. What mattered and what didn't matter for eternity. He says, everything I go through, all the challenges, all the trials, all the stuff on this, the unpleasant parts of life in this body that's failing, life in this world that has fallen, everything I do on this half of the race, everything on this part, whatever hardships are along the way, whatever are just uncomfortable, whatever the parts are that I don't like, that I don't want, (laughs) they won't even register Like the pain of that won't even register when I talk about the incredible weight of glory that is coming on that day. I mean the what he has in store. When I see what he has been preparing, when I get a taste of what heaven is all about, when I see the kingdom with my own eyes, when I step across the divide of fallen into perfect when I see what he had in mind. It won't even register. Do you see it is what he's saying. Like that's the eternal weight of glory. That day will disclose it and listen, it's a day of reward. It's a day of glory. It's a day of joy. It's a day of rejoicing. He says, so we make it our aim to run for an audience of one. So we make it our aim to please him. There's a lot of people out there that want us to please them, or we want to be pleasing in their eyes, but he says, listen, run knowing this. There's an audience of one that matters. Everybody else, not so much. There's one that matters. But here's the cool thing. You please him, and you'll please all the people that matters. You live to please the Lord, and believe me, the people around you will be blessed. Think about this, parents. Every parent wants their kid to have their moment, don't they? Their moment. And you can maybe even go back to some of the moments that your kids had that you just like, Yes, finally. They all see how awesome he is. I got to see him cheered. Game winning hit, baby. Made the team. They got their podium experience on this side of heaven, and we love those moments for our kids, do we not? Any parent remembering any of that? Any parent ever said, I just want my kid to have their moment? Even from the anguish and the pain, like the the strong desire, man, I just, I want them to finally win at something. Are you with me? You know what it feels like. You know what I'm talking about. Your heavenly father wants you to have your moment. I just want you to let that settle in. You know, as parents, It's good to want our kids to have their moment. That's a part of loving them and seeing them thrive. You want them to thrive. That's good. But all of those moments are fleeting on this side of heaven, except for this moment. This particular moment is never going to be fleeting ever again. And your heavenly father is so cheering for you. He is so desiring for you. He has actually gone before you and prepared. He said, listen, I'm giving you the hope to keep running. I'm giving you the, 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 the joy and the, I guess it's also hope, the hope of redemption Like, it's okay if things don't go right. I can redeem them. You're not done. I still got a day for you. It's your day. 
The one thing I love about this, though, the, the, the Bema, is that it's not a competition. All these other ones are competitions. If your kid gets a, a podium moment, it means somebody else didn't get one. But when we stand before Jesus, it's not a competition. It's not against any, each other. It is a us before our, our, our creator. It's us before our king saying, we, our life we lived it for you. Here it is. And the father is saying, that's my son. That's my daughter. Yes. I've been waiting for this moment. I've gone before you. I've dealt with sin. I've worked out the, the kinks and the, the weaknesses in your life so that they're not the, the story of your life. You can keep running. It won't be the quantity of things you did. It'll be the quality that's tested. You think, well, I, don't, I didn't get as far ahead as so-and-so. They started before me. I'm just starting my race. I only got 30 more years to accomplish something. It's not about amount. It's about quality. Run now. Run now. And your father in heaven, nobody is cheering you on more than him. Nobody. All the mamas in the room that want to see their kids stand on the podium right now, I want you to see your father in heaven more than you, times a million you, desire for your kid, saying about you, I can't wait to see you on the podium that day. And all the things that go into that. But if that day is really the day that matters, what do you talk to your kids most about? Parents. Grandparents, those of you without kids yet, what's the picture in front of you? We talk about fixing our eyes on the podium. What's the day that you prepare them for? If I do one thing right as a dad, I want it to be that my kids have an expectation and an excitement for this day and that they would... They would want to live a life to please him. That's, that's my hope. That's all. That's my hope. As a grandparent, I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to my grandkids about this day, to prepare them for the day. And as a pastor, I can't wait to talk to you about this day and prepare you for that day. Kayla Harrison is an Olympic gold medalist. She won gold for judo, and she's also an MMA fighter, uh, but she won gold for judo in uh, 2012 Olympics. She won gold in 2016 Olympics, and I just want you to catch this quote that I found from her. Every night I visualize myself winning the Olympics. I picture myself bombing the girl in the final and standing on top of the podium and watching the flag go up and feeling the gold medal around my neck and hugging my coach. I visualize all of that every night. And again, we're talking about a fleeting podium versus an eternal, an eternal reward. Every night she says I do this. Every night I put this in front of me. Every night that's the picture. Let me ask you, Christian, every day is this in front of you? Have you put this anywhere? Is this the picture in front of you? Is it, as a parent, is this the picture you put in front of your kids, preparing them for this day? This is the only day that has eternal reward. And then lastly, be a race champion and not a chump. It's an old word, I know some of you. I don't know the new lingo for chump. So troll, I don't know. I was like, I don't know. It doesn't, C and C has got to be a CH, so it doesn't work. Chump's going to have to be. Romans 14, he's addressing the church again. Man, we're a hot mess, aren't we? Let's just own it sometimes. He's addressing the church again for all of the ways that they point out each other's they judge one another. You're not doing it enough. You're not running hard enough or fast enough. You're not working hard enough. Your motives aren't pure. I don't know about this. And he just, oh, guys, come on. How about we get rid of all that stuff? Don't forget about the day. 
Forget about the day. That will all get sorted out in the day. You don't need to be that person. You don't need to be that person. Are you with me? He says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? We'll all stand before the Bema of God. For it is written as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So let each of us give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. As we move into this divisive charge season again, if we learned anything in the past, if we've learned anything in hundreds of years of church history, is the church can be so about things like this. Well, you know your doctrine is a little off. Well, you don't think right about this thing. Well, you believe this thing about that. You believe this about that. Stop it. He says, listen, who are you to judge another man's servant? A little earlier in this same passage. It's before his own master that he stands or falls. That day is where we get to stand. And so instead of having to be a troll, instead of having to be a chump and mess people up and they're trying to run and telling them they're not running right, you're not pumping your arms fast enough, you're not lifting your hands high enough in worship, you're not doing it right. Instead of doing that and acting like that and judging each other's motives that you can't see. Are you with me? How about you make a commitment to not put anything in front of them that's gonna make it harder to run. Instead, why don't you be a champion of those who are trying to run their race? Champion them, coach them up, give them, I remember in elementary school, I got busted because I was running around the track with my friend and we thought it was fun when we got into a big pile, big group of people and didn't see the teachers looking, we were kicking their feet together, and people would eat it, and they'd fall, and they'd just sprawl out, and it was really, really funny. And I, I thought it was great. I was just being a total chump. I was just kicking their feet, and nobody knew who did it. You know, it's like, we knew who did it. And I got busted for it. Like, can we not be those people? Can we just love the church in all of its flavors and expressions? And just let Jesus sort out the non-essential stuff later. Are you with me? But how about this? How about we be a champion to those in their race? Many of you know the story, but in the 1936 Olympic Games, at the rising height of Nazism in Germany, they were still granted to be able to host the Olympic Games. And you remember Jesse Owens and his story. If you don't, it's a fantastic story to learn. And Jesse Owens, this African-American athlete, in fact, there were several African-American athletes that America sent over there. And during the Olympic Games, this whole Aryan race idea of blonde hair, blue eyed, rules the world, and everybody else is inferior to you that Hitler was proposing, not only proposing, it had, bought, it had been fully bought into in Germany at the time. And now here you've got these African American athletes from the US out there competing, and not just competing, winning, 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 winning up against all these odds and all of that cultural force. They're just, and Jesse Owens, I'll never forget reading a book in probably a dentist's office or something like that as a kid. It was like a, but I remember the, 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 the way they wrote it, the, the crowds were, were chanting and yelling, Jesse Owens. He had become a celebrity in Germany, in Nazi Germany, and they cheered him. In the stadium, 100,000 people calling and chanting his name. And he was navigating that moment as graciously as he could. Had his podium moment. And after winning the long jump over the German hero, Luce Long. Luce Long, throughout the Olympics, had been a champion to Jesse in the midst of all the pressure and the pain, 
loose lung, the blonde hair, blue eyed, Aryan specimen that he was. He said, I'm going to resist all the pressure to trip him up. And I want to be a champion because he's up against all of these people who want to see him fail. And he befriended Jesse Owens. I have a couple pictures of them. This is a picture of the victory lap after winning gold in the long jump. He grabbed him arm in arm and said, let's go for a lap. Let's go for a run. And they ran the stadium, the Olympic stadium together, arm in arm. This other picture is just a picture of them. It's, it's, it's widely circulated, the two of them. Jesse Owens would say later that his friendship with Luce Long was more valuable to him than all of the medals he could have won. But Luce Long was a, a champion to Jesse in those Olympic games in his race. Who are you a champion to? We're champions to each other, our spouses in their race. Are we cheering them on? Are we champions to our children and our grandchildren, our neighbors? Are we champions to pastors from other churches? Are we champions to one another? Are we champions to those who are running the race? We can't afford to be chumps, amen? Would you stand with me?